Welcome to the podcast that is guaranteed to improve not only your photography, but your mind, body, and spirit as well. Full of interviews with the top image makers in the industry, where we talk photography, drink whiskey, and fill up the bathtub with high life and PBR. So grab a juice box, a handful of unsalted almonds, and get ready for the show. Episode we have just finished wrapping. We are joined with co-host Seth McGruff McCullough. <laughs> a lot of people don't know your middle name is McGruff. We still have Johnny. He hasn't murdered us in our sleep. Not yet. Not yet. And co-host of the podcast, David Parrish. David, I challenge you this episode to not go on Instagram for thirty minutes and scroll while we're all having a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> challenge accepted. He said. I will rise to that occasion. How are you guys Phone doing? Phone flew across the room. No doing good, fun. man. It's been a good week. Seth, it's, it's great to have you back Thank on the you, podcast. My friend. The last podcast we filmed, I believe, we never even published. Yeah. For I why? don't know if what it, was, happened? It, wasn't, it wasn't fit for public, for, consumption. For public consumption at all. Yeah. It was, the CDC had not approved it, <laughs> and there, it was not CDC. No, it was approved. hazardous to people's. Yeah, it, it was also after a long week of production, and I believe we waited to the end, and right we did it at the end at of the, the end. day of the end of the production. Yeah, and we were tired. We were so tired. We was so that it? Tired. Was it just sleepiness? It was pure in exhaustion. General? Yeah, and just the conversation wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't asking any questions. I think I fell asleep. No one does that. <laughs> None. Nobody pulls a Jeff. So, Johnny, you were on a podcast a few days ago at the beginning of the production, and now we're a week later. We're finally almost done. What day is it? I don't even know what day it's it Wednesday. is. No it's idea. Wednesday, which would make it the <coughs> sixth day of sixth production. Day. Okay, yeah. And we still have one day left, so we're not done. Oh, I know. Trailers. Yes. And, David, how do you feel about this week? It's been a good week. I feel like we got a lot of good content. I mean, Seth made a top secret scoot in an appearance, and that was super cool. Yeah, that was uh, that was kind of last minute, but to be able to just pull up and talk to these guys, and you know, I'm always curious, like what the experience was like for the first time doing a production. And going through that, like what you thought it was going to be before you started. And now you're almost at the end. For me, it was a lot of unexpected stuff, I guess, came out of it. No, definitely. I, I really did not have too much in the way of expectation. I, I tried to leave that by the wayside as much as I could. But That's pretty tough. Yeah, it's definitely ch- tough. Um, but yeah, I've just been, you know, open and, you know, not sleeping enough and doing what I can to try and support what's happening here and being awestruck by all of the talent. For the record, you don't sleep enough because you insist on staying up till the wee hours of the next day. Are you saying it's a personal choice? Yes. Definitely. He's making it sound like, oh, we work him to death. I'm like, it's 945. I'm like, I'm going to bed. Johnny's like, one more shot, Gary. Gary, what are we not friends? I I may have said that like... (laughs) Every night? Three to 12 times. <laughs> That's well, it. It's kind That's of those, it. those hours under those conditions that you can discover some, some really incredible ideas for the next day and then promptly forget them. See? It was yeah. brainstorming. That's what it was. It had nothing to yeah. do with it's know, work habitual patterns. Yeah, not write, at all. Write that off. Yeah. So, Seth, you coming out of here was kind of last minute. You yeah. Know, as the economy is opening back economy like just the society is opening the world. back up the world you know we all it's got real. the vaccine and we're like okay we feel safe everyone hop on a plane yeah. or drive out a few people drive out but everyone was finally fully back so how do you feel but like now even still it's kind of sketchy mm-hmm. right yeah i was totally sketched out when i first and i even took a trip to costa rica in like two months ago thought i had 
gotten comfortable with flying and all the stuff I got to do to stay safe. And even with the Vax, I still felt sketched out coming out of here. Yeah. You know, like what is, what are the standards? Do I still need to wear a mask? Is everybody vaxxed? I don't know. But now I've kind of chilled out because David, you know, you research stuff to like insane levels. Yeah. Right? It's really a sickness. Yeah. So you, so you <laughs> calm me down about it. I've got the second vax. Everybody here is yep. fully, so you can't. When do you guys actually think around? they turn on the five G chip? Because my cell phone reception hasn't increased <laughs> or anything. So yeah, I want to know when they turn the hardware on. Hardware too. No, I, I've oh, seen a pretty big it. improvement. It's it's yeah. a firmware oh, okay. update for that to kick in. Yeah. No, it was it was and, weird. And I'm I'm gypped because I saw this like YouTube stuff and the magnet thing, but my magnet doesn't work. Look, it just comes right off. Like, well, that's that. that's uh, second gen. Oh yeah, God. yeah. You're behind. You have to upgrade your hardware in order for it to work. With <coughs> your software. Oh. So when I get my next like booster shot fax, you're that's good. when I get that yeah. stuff. No, you have to like physically change bodies. Oh, it's like yeah. altered carbon. So where? You get a new shell. But I totally missed that software. in the research. Not if we destroy a stack. Yeah, he knows. He gets it. He's I watched it. I watched it. I, I think I watched everything during the pandemic. <laughs> what, like, so, Seth, what what happened with? Let's back up. Yeah. How did did work dry up? Did you change, you know, your, your business model? What happened as a retoucher who really doesn't have to see anyone ever? Yeah. Yeah. I have that luxury. I could just sit in a dark room until I shrivel and die. But no, the, uh, the, the, the work, the work, uh, the work definitely uh, dried up and there was a pretty long spell of nothing because marketing budgets just got all frozen across the board. Uh, Everybody was asking questions of industry friends of like, how is this looking? Is there any forecast? What are you guys doing? Um, nobody knew anything. So we just had to sit and wait, basically. That gave me space. Luckily, I was in a good place beforehand to just start focusing on like creative work. And, and that was actually totally refreshing. And I think a lot of people did that. Then marketing budgets started slowly coming back uh, online in a big way. And yeah, all these brands and agencies are just like all the engines are running again, you know, and people are maybe even more fluid with working now because I think everybody's just already set up for everything they need to do in terms of communication. You know what I mean? There's, I've finally gotten to the point where my Zoom calls don't involve me screwing around with my camera and cursing <laughs> and failing within the first five minutes every time, you know. I still haven't even landed there yet. You haven't? My Sony messes up every time. Yeah. What? Yeah? It's because yeah. he doesn't have the cam link, so it does this thing where, like, that's what software I software initiating because he's using the internal Sony. Because yeah, oh, no. Sony link. released it its, its own software, which... I don't know. After a while, it goes to sleep. It's it whatever. works. You just need to always turn it on. Yeah, I had a small version of that. Um, like, uh, w was it like a judge who got turned into a no? Uh, it was a it was a lawyer. An attorney got turned into a cat for the whole Zoom call. That happened in my hometown. That was from El Paso. That's what El Paso is known for. Uh, well, up until lawyer the hot cat. Cheeto <laughs> incident a few days ago, that's what El Paso was known okay, for. Okay, cool. So, like, El Paso is the place. Where all the like, jokes happen. It's yeah. just like pop culture yeah, memes basically. emerge yeah. out of. Basically. I had a I had a green Zoom call where I was green the entire time. And and that was. Like your skin was green? Or the, 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 it like was, you hulk it out? It was just sort of a green. <laughs> Did you own that? Filter? Did you just be like, you don't want to see me mad. You don't like Seth. I would have owned green. that. But was your beard still red? Because <laughs> Yeah, no, that show, showed you like Chris through <laughs> because, because it was a complimentary color. Excuse me, guys. I happen to know color grading. Sorry. Jeez. I <laughs> hope so, since the tutorial was called Advanced Color Grading. Ooh, way to tie it. I actually love that tutorial. I have to say that. You stop. That's seriously. Really? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so digging into that was a big yeah. deal. So on your tutorials, plural, um, you send me a lot of messages because people instinctively reach out to you, like uh, retouching houses, people that are getting into retouching, you're like, yo, we took your first commercial retouching workflow tutorial and implemented it into our entire agency. And that's like the Bible. And like you always ping me when you get them. 
That's yeah, because awesome. I get so stoked. So I'm you like, basically yeah. wrote SOPs for retouching houses by making a tutorial. Amazing. Yeah, I wish I wish I would have found that back when I was figuring all out, it all out. But uh, they seem to like it, and whenever I get one of those messages, it's kind of like one of those mic drop moments. It's like that's that's the reason you know you make something like that is hopefully that becomes something that solves a ton of problems for and, for people. And correct me if I'm wrong, but just the workflow in general, while Photoshop up, updates and looks different. How much has that changed since the, the several years ago since we released the first of your tutorials? Very, very little. And that, to me, was a, that was like another point that I was like, all right, I kind of did it right, was because uh, the concepts and like the, the reasons why we do all of these stages within the workflow, those are just, those have a long shelf life, right? Um, and the tools you use to, to, to do them, they might change a bit. They might even change dramatically, but they still plug into that way of like thinking and working. I think it's also relative because like you concentrated so much on explaining the logic behind things. So even if the steps change, even if the features change, the, the why doesn't really alter. I mean, like new tools are going to continue to come out. It's going to adapt. It's going to move forward. So the how is really flexible but the why isn't as flexible. And I think like once people start to understand that the secret to the sauce is really in the why I'm doing this thing versus the, this is the step-by-step process, even though your step-by-step process is still valid. Um, I think that that higher thing and, and something I always got out of pro edu tutorials uh, was that like, was that there was a breakdown of, of the why things were happening over just here's the step-by-step process because often in photography or retouching. I mean, there's so many variables between photo to photo or set to set or environment to environment that the why is what really makes the difference. Absolutely. Because, I mean, that's the job, honestly, of, or, or the job that I took on to make something, you know, make a tutorial for pro EDU was, um, is that higher level thinking needs to be like, well articulated that that meta level stuff because that is really the value and that's also the fun of teaching and making something that is uh, that's going to help people you know improve is okay I've been doing it for years do I have the ability to step away from it and like really understand it and unpack it so that started happening you know, during that first tutorial. And since then I've really recognized it as something that is like so satisfying to do. So I'm doing that in all aspects of like looking at my work, my art, my retouching and trying to write and explain what it is at a higher level that, that I'm doing. So other people can actually find applicable stuff they can use in their work. And like, I was going to ask you, Johnny, like, did you go through that process where examining like yourself or your photography, you know, your work, your style, your process, like how'd you get above that to like, I don't know, That's think hard. and see it, you know? Yeah, what I mean, I, mean I, I think it's hard to move out of that very almost kind of dysfunctional deconstructive stage into an overview perspective. So it, it probably happened fairly recently, to be honest. Uh, where I could start looking at things more holistically, but I don't, I don't think that there's, you know, a timeline for that. We all kind of come to it in our own way. So yeah, it's, it's a curious thing. There's something that has to do with uh, taking the next step though, when you're able to do that, like, cause when you're first trying to learn or put together your look or your portfolio or something, you're just kind of like scrapping and just doing right. And there's a stage you know, that I, that's the stage that I really like where I was able to step back and go, what's behind those decisions. And then what are those decisions rooted in? Maybe they're rooted in art history. Maybe they're rooted in color theory. Maybe they're rooted in, I don't know, language or something. Uh, That's the fun part for me. I think a lot of it's just understanding what drives you. And I, I didn't realize this until very recently. Um, 
I was really struggling with trying to, I, I initially reached out to a couple of photographers because I was trying to understand this concept of uh, a lot of times I see people who go through certification programs, whether that's through PPA or whatever, to become a certified professional photographer. And then once they've achieved that, it seems like, like maybe the creativity gets sucked out of the cells. And so I was really trying to understand why that happens. Um, and I reached out to Lindsay and Chris and I, and well, specifically I reached out to Chris and then he brought Lindsay into the conversation because, um, you know, she's gone through that certified professional photographer route, but something that they said to me is really resonated was, you know, like you can't be a fashion photographer like Johnny, unless you love fashion, who, if you see him, he clearly loves fashion and you can't be a portrait photographer if you don't like people. So I think finding out what is connecting you to the craft that you've chosen is, is such a critical element to really defining your style and taking you beyond I'm doing to now I'm, I'm building, I'm developing, I'm storytelling. I, I have this narrative portion now because there's something I'm, I'm trying to translate why I care about this to why I want you to see why I care about this totally. versus I'm just fumbling. And I think, I mean, I think about as my time as a photographer, I have fumbled into success a lot of times, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't an intentional walking into success. And I think that becomes the yeah. difference is at some point you understand why you're doing this or, or maybe you understand that you're not being as intentional. Like, uh, you well, know, what that's that saying, like walking is actually falling in a forward direction, you're just doing a good job of putting your feet in front of you. Right. Well, I mean, the, the saying that comes to mind to me was, uh, I mean, I was a soldier for a really long time. So we have a saying that's called slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And that's specifically related to like room clearing procedures when you need to come busting in. And that's sometimes when you do the methodical, when you slow down, that slowing down allows you to actually speed up because you're, 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 you're taking very intentional measures in making sure that you achieve something that is in unison and is ultimately looks really, really fast, but it, but all of the steps were really, really intentional and really, really thought out and really, really slow. And I don't know why I never thought about that in relation to our craft. Um, cause I obviously had thought about that tons in relation to a, a military application. But, uh, once I started having that conversation and thinking about it, I think it became so clear to me that there were so many ap applicable elements here in photography, retouching, whatever, like slowing down and, and understanding what drove you here, I think is really the secret to breaking through to the, the next level. That's awesome. I, I love that, that metaphor, but what I, what it was reminding me of was me when I was 20 years old and going, I have no idea why I do shit at all. Mm -hmm. Like I so three don't years have ago. a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for young man. For outing I appreciate me. that. Um, yeah. Like I have no why behind my house. So I'm just going to keep howling. You yeah. know, I, wait, is that right? Did I do that? But anyway, I thought you said house and I was like, I heard no, that too. Yeah. Whatever. Let's move on. Uh, but like, you know, I imagine me watching this podcast and going, that's great, you guys, but I don't know how to get to the ethical system behind mm -hmm. my visual work. And that's what I wanted to ask you if you had, because I I see your work and I see also the way that you like uh, use, you use apparel as a, a, a creative expression and you use it very intentionally to sort of bring meaning not only into your visual work, but into the spaces that you step into, right? It's a, it's a, it's active. It's like, like you say, it's intentional. And I'm curious when you started to put that together, because right now it seems very cohesive to me and maybe earlier in your career, it wasn't very cohesive or you didn't know what you wanted to do with all this stuff. So you were kind of assembling it. Do you, is there anything to that? No, I mean, that's actually what I wanted to talk about. So <laughs> it was perfect <laughs> synchronicity. All right. Um, you know, it's I, one I, of your favorite 10 words. Yeah. We <laughs> talked about that, that earlier yeah. Yeah, <laughs> among all the words that I use and talk too much. <laughs> but, um, I think as a photographer, I've always been really good at pulling something out of a scene. 
So I started off just kind of off the cuff and I'm like, we're just going to throw all of these variables in. I have no idea what's going on and I'm going to try and pull magic out of this. And I'm, I'm talented at that. Uh, but it's just been over the past, let's say year and a half where I started taking all of those variables into account and saying, okay, how do I want this to turn out? What is my actual vision? And, and doing so made me feel good about my art because before I kind of felt like, oh, I'm just like slap shot, good at dealing with chaos, which is true. But that did not make me feel good about the end product because it just right. sort of happened. Um, so getting more intentional, we've talked about like intentional lighting during this tutorial and all of these other things. I feel like I've actually taken these variables and been very intentional about how I'm piecing that together. And it's been a challenge, but it's also been fulfilling because my mind doesn't work like that. Gary can attest to that. He's been around me enough. My mind is not an intentional mind. I'm sort of a dog off the leash type of thing. And Man, just, I, I'm right there with you. So it's it's been really interesting for me to actually piece this all together, which is, you know, going back to your tutorial just for a moment, like that's why it was good for me to like deconstruct color in a very systematic way. Like all of these systems and processes and David is looking at me right now who knows nothing about systems and processes, but it's been, it's been huge for my workflow and for my life and for my world, because actually being able to look at something and put together a plan and then follow through on that plan creatively and create an image that's not only good, but something that I sort of foresaw. I don't know if that's a word, but, um, no, it totally is. Yeah. It's, it's been really amazing creatively. Well, it's, it's cool too, because making, these these works these like meta works that are these tutorials they're like you know where we step one step further analyze everything that actually as artists i think like i and we probably progress from the act of making these uh, these tutorials you know because it's like gives you a project and i kind of use this and i like suggest it to people like do some kind of systematic, like, look at whatever it is you've made so far. See if you can get some kind of, like, map about how that was made, you know? Because for us, this this is the the map that we documented and yeah. well, I think other people I, use I feel it. like that's the barometer of what you just said of, you know, it, it makes you better. Um, so, you know, kind of like the barometer that I use when looking at someone is, all right, talk, you know, talk to me about why you do something. And if they've already thought it out and kind of have this like game plan that they can reference, it's a much easier yes, even if their you know work is phenomenal or just okay. Mm -hmm. The work has to be great. The second thing and like the, the biggest, the most important thing is, do I know why I'm doing this? And like, what can I then teach it? So like, you know, like yeah. working with you, like you always had, a very specific like workflow that was there for a reason that was built on like decades of experience and getting that out and then getting it onto a, a curriculum. That's, that's kind of our job or our department. Yeah. You know, part of the production. But I, that is always the hardest thing because there have been some photographers that are phenomenal, but that if they can't really explain what they're doing and why, then it's like, well, it's going to be hard to like put this into a tutorial where you have to talk for seven straight days. Well, yeah, the two aren't exclusive. I mean, I, I think there are definitely artists out there are types of artists who just don't want to do that self-referential or uh, evaluative work. You know what I mean? Like, yep. like, like it might, it might stop them from making something that's really cool because they know they need to like just go for it or something, you know? I think, um, I think teaching forces you to, I mean, in explaining things to somebody else, like we all develop our processes over experience. Like I've tried new things, I, I've discarded things. And, and I think we forget between point A and point B why we decided that this was the process and this one wasn't, or I'm replacing this step of the process with a new thing. But when you have to now think from a student perspective or so somebody who's absorbing this information, you have to think from that perspective. You have to really analyze for yourself, like, why do I do this? And in answering that question for somebody else, you're really answering it for yourself and, and, mm. and even reevaluating, like, is this something that I want to keep in my flow or, you know, maybe I've discovered a different system and I'm 
I'm doing this out of habit more than I'm doing this out of intention. And I think that's what you learn as a teacher. You start to learn that as I'm explaining this to you, like, is it still passing the logic test with all of my experience and all of my knowledge? Like, is this still passing? And I, I mean, at least my experience as an instructor, I found often I was changing belief systems or changing processes or even changing how I pitched things because I was explaining it to somebody else and further getting their feedback when they're like, I mean, that's the unfortunate part about tutorials is that we don't have that, that customer immediate feedback to say, I don't understand. Um, But in those moments when somebody's like, Hey, I, I have a question and they ask you those things and you're like, huh, I mean, think about that, Is but that in it, right you're way? really discovering for yourself, like, why do I do these things? Yeah, absolutely. And it's important also, I think, to recognize that, like, I think to hold intentionality in too high regard is like a mistake, right? Because um, these are all balances, like, you know, Dustin always talks about, is balancing intentionality and structure with chance and exploration. Right. Um, so that was, I was going to ask you like now that you've gained that like self-awareness and process, like, do you, do you intentionally put a space for accidents into the photography or discoveries or something? How do you know, how do those happen? I, I think I'm getting at when things are too closely managed, John, maybe nothing interesting happens. Part of more accidents than I, I've <laughs> heard of another person being a part of. Well, this anytime is, I walk rubbish. into his studio, and he's like happy. I libel, knock something libel. over. So slander. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, that's, that's a great question. And honestly, regardless of what I'm shooting, I always book in time to be spontaneous, to push to, stuff over. Exactly. To be exploratory. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, yeah. and it's like all of a sudden I'm using constant light or just the you know natural light in my studio, and I plan on using strobe. So I have to do that to feel good as a creative, because that's what feeds my spirit. Like that's who I am. So moving into a more structured workflow and mindset and something more intentional has been great for my planning and being able to you know have everything set up in a way that I know it's it's going to result in a certain output. You're like baseline. Exactly. You got your minimum viable product. But, done. but beyond that, it, you know, if, if I'm just doing that, then it's just work for me. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I've worked in a lot of fields and there's easier ways to make money than art. And so that doesn't do anything for me. So even if it's just 30 minutes at the end of the session, I'm clear with my clients and I'm like, okay, listen, now we're just going to, I'm just going to kind of mess around and see what happens. That's so cool. That's, that's such like something that everybody can use. Like, Absolutely do that like put time in in the end for and i don't know how common that is you know in my work i'm always just trying stuff but i don't have to negotiate it with anybody because i'm sitting in my studio but putting time in to just like let's move all this stuff around and let's see what happens i think experientially with clients it's it's kind of a cool thing because you as the artist they're coming to you because of your art so to say hey you know what you have this look or this aesthetic or this is what's going on in our shoot and i want to try something new are you okay with that? It brings them into the fold in a way where they're then empowered because it's, you're, you're just not lifting them up. They're lifting you up. And so the whole experience shifts relative to that, where even if we, you know, got into the baseline of like sales and things, their experience shifts in a way that's just really incredible. So we can, we that's can where co- you switch to like, you're in a collaborative. Exactly. Mode. And, and, and to me, that is art. Art is collaboration. You know, it's never the output of one person. And it's best. And it's, in the best cases. It, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Stuff's like, it's not always like that. Uh, Commercial for me. Minds. Yeah. D- different mindset. But yeah, no, that, that's that's a great bit. But I, I, I do it not, and this is another instance where I don't necessarily think it's intentional, but I, I have to because that's what's, it, it's what keeps me connected to the art form, which is why I'm here. So I have to maintain some semblance of rooting or I just start to look at it as another thing. And as we've talked about a lot, David and Gary and I, you know, I've done a lot of things and I don't want photography to become another thing. Well, you're um, past the six month mark. So things are looking good. It's looking true. pretty good for you. This yeah. is true right yeah, now. This might that's, turn into a year or two, actually. Maybe. That's, that's been the joke this week of learning about Johnny's past is like, yeah, no, I was an EMT. You know, went through that process. And I was an I'm EMT. really good oh, with wait, a saber. Wait, what? I, David and I'm like, what? So you could, huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I was an EMT for six months. And I got bored with it. Nine. I went to firefighter school. Graduated yeah. top of my class. I didn't want to do it anymore. And didn't, uh, I realized I didn't like being hot. <laughs> I'm I'm infatuated <laughs> that, with that's infatuation. Why, that's why know. that's why firefighters stop. Yeah. Right. No. And then uh, earlier today, the, earlier today, John was like. Yeah, down when I was living in Florida, uh, I was, uh, you know, a, a youth pastor out on the corner. I, didn't, I, I said youth gospel, leader. Youth, youth leader. leader. That, that one crazy. blew my mind. Yeah, no. I was like, holy. I did that. I, I I spoke to people do you remember, in downtown. Like, do you remember what you would say? I mean, I would just talk to them about their lives. And, I mean, we're outside of bars, and I'm. And you're like 14. Yeah, I mean, younger than that at that point, twelve between 12 and 14. So starting at 12, literally standing on, you know, my soapbox on my hierarchical pedestal, you know, talking to people going, listen, there's another way. And people would come up and it was, it was a conversion based thing. You know, I, I were was, some people who came out of the bar though startled by you. I mean, I, mean, <laughs> I didn't have you see a 12 year old kid with a head tattoo. It's yeah. very startling. So in, in yeah. fairness, I looked like I was part of a boy band at that time. So it was like khakis, frosted tips, no tattoos. I still would have been startled. Probably still jewelry. Like Creed. Uh, well, yeah, kind, kind of like Creed. Creed. Is there a photo of this? I was there with arms wide oh, open yeah. for anyone who came out of the bar. I mean, as like, I'm sitting here drinking, it's dude, a thing. kid, why are you telling me this? You know, yeah. and you're like, just out of the good of my heart. I'm yeah. like, you sure you're not like, do I owe you anything? You were just doing it for good. I was just doing it for good. It felt good. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all, we all operate on this, I think, context of trying to um, feel like what we do matters and we matter. And trying to find fulfillment. And for me at that point in time, I, you know, my, my childhood was nuts. And so I had all of this guilt and, you know, an adult mindset as a child, essentially. And so that was my way of, of you know, paying penance for being alive, as, as odd as that sounds. But I'm like, I want to try and help people because that, that makes me feel good and worthy in a way, which is odd. Well, it's weird, too, because I... Uh you know, you're I'm gonna, here you're gonna, for it. I, I knew you were going to hit you. that. Do that again. I'm here for it. We're all here for it. <laughs> are you here for it? That made me happy. Yeah. Are you here for yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm here for it, man. <laughs> Cheers, guys. <laughs> Salute. Well, you know, since we've been on this production, all of us spending time in this spot, just, you know, immersed in thinking about like what we do art our brains why we do it trying to unpack it Every, it seems like so many artists and and in all the conferences that i go to the you know the friends that i have who are now working artists we all bounced around like so much and i've talked with multiple people about that about the danger sort of that we faced because of those personalities because of the you know, the need that we had to, to figure out what it was. And it usually goes through finding a bunch of different things to do that looks pretty irrational to somebody who doesn't work like that, who's got like a career path or is working in a linear fashion. We jump around a bunch and then if we're lucky, like we don't mess ourselves up and we become, you know, a photographer who has a whole bunch of stuff that kind of like you can talk about that informs, you know, what you do, why you do it, you know, and landing. I think that's, that's the weird thing, right? We, we walk this line between being exploratory and being intentional. And that's, that's kind of a hard pass because, you know, people will talk to me and they're like, Oh, I know your work when I see it, but your work's so different. And you know, there's all of these things. So I want to push the limits because I don't want to get comfortable as an artist and a creative uh, but at the same time, I also want to have a visual signature. So when someone sees my work, they know that it's mine. Um, and so, I mean, art in general challenges us to kind of be dualistic in a way. And especially being a professional artist. I mean, we're, we're literally walking this line between logistics and expression. Yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's a complicated sort of intermingling. It can be painful. I just try to, like, separate the two as much as I can. You know what I mean? In terms of the creativity versus the technical I'm getting better at that. It's hard. It's so, tough because you can't switch back and forth fast between the two. It's true. So besides you being in the photo, how would I identify a Johnny photo? 
That's the weird thing. I don't, I don't look at my work and this, this goes back to perspective bias. Like I don't see my work the way that any of you see my work just, and I, I think that's inherent for all artists, but, um, not I Van would, Gogh. Not he Van kinda, Gogh. He kind of always knew. Yeah, they're, they're like, they know me. <laughs> I might, I might need to cut off my ear. Um, I'd like to think it, it's, it's predicated on connection. You know, more than anything else in my photos, I love to just recognize the person who's in frame and hopefully create a space for them to be whoever they are. And I think that comes across as something that feels very uh, authentic and evocative, um, emotionally speaking. And, you know, I like shadows and I like golden green tones, but it's like there's a, a million photographers who like that. So in the end, I think it really comes down to how I connect with the people in front of me. And that's that's my joy. That's my love is I feel honored anytime someone steps in front of my camera and I try and honor them through that process. And, and somehow that translates. And I don't, I don't know how to articulate that, which is funny because I'm never at a loss for words, but I, uh, I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> Except for twice today when we've asked you to explore words or the two uh, times that you've been lost in words. All right, well, only at Pro-EDU am I lost so for words. Do you think, can anyone think of artists that's known when you see a color or color combination? Oh, it's that artist. Dan Winters, and right what, off the bat. And what is that? It's called? green. Dan Winters it's, green. Yeah. I mean, there's... But, there's but even move beyond that. So, like, I think there's periods of time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. I appreciate the... <laughs> like, but he did. Just it, completely like, negating. But, he, but, I mean, he did. He moved beyond it. Like, there was a period no. of time when I, when I would agree with you 100%. Like, there's... When, when, it's a brief like, moment in like, time. no, I mean, like, they're like Dan Winters <laughs> shooting Tom but it's, Hanks, but like it's, that's, it's, that's it's not even green. green. So there's like a weird, to me at least, my eyes, and I'm, you know, halfway blind, so forgive me here, but it's, there's, wait, there's wait, like, what? Back it the fuck up. What do you mean you're halfway blind? Stop I mean, like, this bus. eye, my, my brother stuck uh, a spatula in my eye, the handle of it in my left eye when I was younger, and so this eye is literally like, 2200 and that didn't come out it's of the unfixable. childhood trauma question i asked earlier that was the least of my childhood <laughs> trauma for those who are interested oh, let's continue that was really low did he not know that a fork actually might work better no, this I'm was considering the, he was in the kitchen this was, was the same special. guy who tried to drown me and hung me off of you know rooftop buildings brian if you're listening you really messed me up and uh this is why we don't this talk is, this is your brother so, yeah this is my brother but you don't speak full, to him anymore. full brother half, half brother, brother half, half brother yeah same mom, different dad. And, all right. Let, walk me through what led up to you being hung off of a building. I want to hear this story. We were, so this was, this was back in Chicago, in a suburb of Chicago in Wheaton. And uh, my mom had a place in Wheaton Towers. Mom, what's up? You were killing it as a businesswoman at that point in time in a male-dominated field. Uh, but anyway, I, he was just there, and I was a smart-ass kid. Like, I was always intelligent, so I must have been seven what, years old. Seven. I must have been seven. seven. And I, I called him out on something. I can't recall the specifics, but he had, you know, made a dumb comment. You make a lot of dumb comments, Brian. Um, and I, I called him out on it. And so his response was to hang me by my ankles off of the balcony on the 20th story of this building and threaten to drop me. What that was, was the temperature outside? I mean, it, it was Did probably like an, breath? It was probably like an ambient, like 58 <laughs> degrees or so, I think. Yeah. 58, so no breath. No breath. No, bro. Ooh, are you trying shorts to, at that semi humid? I was wearing shorts. Gary, are you like just trying to complete the mental image? Is that yeah? Like, I, I, Gary I need, needs to I see need it. Description so I can see it in my head. I got you. I was probably wearing like a Bart Simpson it's funny shirt. That way. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you can laugh at this. That makes me feel good. So what did you say? Well, you clearly made be, it through. <laughs> what did you say for you to be brought back up? Like I didn't. I didn't say anything. I was just screaming. So I was you're a just child. you're just stoic, like oh, you're not gonna drop me. No, I wasn't. I wasn't like bowing up. I wasn't trying to, you know, play it hard or I anything. I dare I, you to drop me. I was afraid that I was going to die. But you know what mom's going to say when you she would gets in, home? You would in that moment like be like, how am I going to play this though? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I would. I don't know. I've never been in that moment. I don't so. know. I was, I was a child. Okay. So no, I, that, the, the complex thoughts were not running through my mind. It was my brother's holding me off the ledge and I'm going to die. How much and older is Brian intended. than you? Oh, like 13 years. Oh. So he's, yeah, he's so 20 he's, at the time. Oh, man. it's like, if yeah, he's a man. He, the, he was a man. He's, walk, he's walking child. into this intentionally. Oh, absolutely. Like, he's very psychotic. Much so. Brian, I mean, he's, you're psychotic. He's hosting he's, a party in the house while mom's away. Uh, yeah. Why was and he then, still carrying spatulas, though? It seems like he's beyond that. Well, no, like the spatula issue. was a different incident. I was younger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's, it's, it's a, it's a history of drama with that guy. Got it. Wow. <laughs> I'm just going to take a moment wow. to appreciate this. Unpack that. It's a moment of silence for little Johnny. I don't know how to get a high-level view on that 
what we just went through. I mean, twenty yeah. stories up yeah. is pretty high. <laughs> it was it was pretty high. It was it was a long drop. I mean, it's not into a pool, ten feet up. So it was a thing. All right, let's. Can let's, we talk about let's art back again? Up. Yeah, let's back up. Something about I am crying. Why right were you now? asking you the question about um, an artist who had a distinctive style that you can think of the color? Well, he was talking about style, and I was no, like, you were. We're, we it's were such a about it's such a weird thing. I think there's, identifies there's so many style. things that come into style because like I, was, I see people who have used props before that define their style so like irving pin's corner for mm -hmm. example like that was a prop it, i mean Infamous. yeah he lit it the same way and everything but like that became a, a style point for him um so i think that there are things i mean i've been following johnny uh on social media long before we ever met long before i tried to introduce him to anybody um he went through a very long process i think of exploring other people's style before he kind of entered into this space where to me there's a, a cohesiveness of tonalities is the best way that I can describe it so there's it's often um one side of the color wheel heavy uh but not it's not monochromatic because there's always some other color in there mm. but it's usually like very heavy into one color toning um and that's so between that and lighting and i guess a lack of heavy retouching all help to define me like when i'm scrolling and being like oh well this is a johnny edward image because mm. um you know there's there's this chemistry in the tones there is a beautiful mostly soft lit until recently, recently there's been more exploration into hard light. Um, and I think that that, and then I would say, even though he said this himself and it could be mental priming from that, but a lot of texture. So textures in clothing, textures in backgrounds, mm -hmm. textures in materials, um, that is really helps kind of grunge it up and give it even a level of noise maybe, but that's actually there versus, you know, like artists who want to put in digital noise onto it to kind of cohesively tie it together. He seems to have a really good eye for materials in the moment that is tying everything together in the same way that you might use digital noise to make cohesion happen. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, two questions. First of all, about exploring others styles which personally i think is hugely important absolutely if you can do it yeah. and second um how are you using texture in the shots are there ones where it looks where, where it works really well and you're using a bunch of it like that fur texture basically on the coat or something like you showed i think you showed me last night yeah. is that does that feature and then everything else is sort of like a contrast to bring that texture forward or something? I mean, great questions. I'm going to do the politician thing, give myself a moment to think here. But um, no, I, I, I think it's for me, my process is very spontaneous, even in that, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of really great backdrops, for instance, in canvas. And then obviously I'm lucky to work with great designers and people pull great pieces who work with me. So uh, generally speaking, I have a plan and then that plan gets completely dismantled day of shoot because I look at something and they come in and I'm like, you know, this is what I was going to do, but now I need to pivot because I was shooting for the backdrop. Now I'm shooting for a piece of clothing. And so uh, I just try and roll with that. And I think that going back to the idea of authenticity and it's, this, this is the hard thing, right? Like moving into education, it's like, well, how do you teach a process that, that for me is inherently chaotic? And we'll, we'll see if that starts with out. an outline. I don't think it is. So I'm going to call you out and say no, because your daily activities include mixing textures together on your body in a way that's cohesive and makes sense and is pleasing. So again, you care about fashion and your fashion uh, tends to go deeply into vintage repurposed uh secondhand materials that you're assembling like because rarely in in vintage shopping do you get to get that whole complete piece so you're literally in 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 your daily expression practicing what you bring to photography your daily you're going into your closet and being like here's all of these things now i see them they're all together 
but I'm going to assemble them into the perfect outfit that's going to work for the expression in the world. So I think how you dress on the daily is what brings out the style that you present in photography because you're constantly practicing the assembly of texture and materials and things that aren't supposed to go together to create the cohesive. I think that's that's very fair and I guess I guess to me it it because of that since I do it on the daily and kind of live that on the daily it doesn't feel uh, I guess consciously intentional. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and so that's that's what what is part of it, right? I think I think you've basically created a daily practice that has fed into your your style and your expression, and so because you practice it daily, it feels so natural. But if we unpack it, there's a process. There was a process that led to the thing that now becomes natural, and I think that's as artists, that's what we're all going for. We're going for this process that this daily practice, I I like to call it uh, ordinary magic, right? So it looks, and that's not my term, just to be perfectly clear, there's a researcher that's named Ann Mastin that came up with it. But um, in in psychology, when she was presenting it, it was happened to do with resilience, but I think it applies here. But, you know, to the outside eye, to the person who doesn't understand the process, it looks like magic. But the reason it's ordinary magic is because it's a step it's a, it's a series of steps. It's yeah. a series of, of practices that when put together there, each one is very small in its measure, but when put together, it looks extraordinary. And like I think pancakes. that's exactly just like pancakes, just like pancakes, because it's just a bunch of ordinary Thanks, elements that put together to be one of the greatest things on the planet. So. I feel like I'm like out in the dark. Right now, how is that like pancakes? Because pancakes are simple, s- like five Gary's simple hungry. ingredients. That's he has low blood sugar. There's like a it's lot of a, simple things that when you look at those individually, you're like, yeah, those are just ingredients. But then when you do a certain uh, combination thing to those things in a certain order, that recipe that becomes it's extraordinary. Magic. No, that totally makes sense now. Yeah, <laughs> it's so, an, but I it's think an <laughs> aggregate that is delicious, and that's the thing that I think most beginners in any field well, don't understand yeah. is they're looking for. They're looking for that one action they can buy. They're yeah. looking for that one plugin that they can put into Photoshop that will reveal all of the secrets that all of us are harboring from yeah. them and keeping them away from. No, no, I'm, I'm still looking for that. Right. True. I mean, it would it'd be great, but it doesn't exist. Well, and, so, and, but understanding that if you start to unpack processes, if you start to look at people, people's journey, if you start to look at what they do, their daily practices, their daily habits are what establishes yeah. their success. It's just trying to unpack that and oh, understand yeah, yeah. that and you be know. like, and, and call Johnny out and like for things like this, like you literally do this every single yeah. day. I, you might not understand it, but this is, a, this is how this builds into the next well, thing. And I think that's a, a really salient point. You know, I get messages a lot and people are like, oh, how long have you been doing this? What have you been doing? And oftentimes I'm like, oh, like professionally for four years or whatever. And they're like, well, oh my God, you know, like where you're at, how have you done this? And it's like, this is my life. Yeah. You know, like literally this art and photography is my life. Like so I, way longer than four yeah, years. Re- relationships. Have, down to it, it is uh, ultimately if you were to, uh, if you were to unpack it to use David's verbiage that way it is, but I've dedicated myself to this. So it's, you know, I, this has never been a thing where I'm like, Oh, maybe one day I'll get good at photography. Like as you know, macabre as it might sound, I'm like, okay, I'm going to succeed at this or I'm going to die. It's one, one or the other. And it's that serious. And so I've, I've given myself to it and educated myself and tried and, and failed, failed. I fail every day and just continuously failed. And I fail forward. I just, I keep failing forward and falling forward. I fail, so, are you quoting I, Bob Saget? What? I am. Yeah. I, there's, there's other things he said that I can't quote on this podcast because he's I, a maniac. I, I, have, I fail up and to the right. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. It's usually slight curve but it was funny you know because i was like sitting there listening and 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 thinking about like what david said about this daily practice and i was looking at your shirt your vest your tie your thing that goes here that i don't know what those are called i don't even know what it's called either color clip but the colors all of those color choices are intentional you know i always my wife always jokes with me she's like that's just gray i'm like it's not gray like there's nothing that doesn't have color for me. Yeah, like a same. gray always has an identity. So that gray from where I'm sitting with my eyes is looking slightly green, but it's highly muted. Your shirt is maroon muted. Yeah. 
we could go further. But all of these all of these hues are working together in a very cohesive manner. And that's a practice that didn't happen by accident. Right. Um, and you've got that yellow pop right there, which is a compliment. And it should always be like that. It should always be small and hot and the rest of it should be muted. So when you're talking about scrolling through his images, you know, you're seeing that cohesion too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, I think this is what we lost as people started to move away from assisting others is the secret to photography or, or really any performance related endeavor is, is to roll all the way back to the start of this conversation is understanding the why in things. And you can only find the whys and find those, those opportunities to practice the, the small steps that will lead to the extraordinary by observing somebody over a period of time. I mean, and that's a lot of what I do. I mean, in, in looking at, at it from a performance expertise side or, um, trying to unpack the psychology of why people operate at a higher level. I think a lot of those uh, opportunities are lost in the fact that people are in such a great hurry to reach success that they ultimately end up pounding their face against a wall repeatedly trying to find success or buy their way to success. And, and they're missing what is obviously right in front of them because they won't submit themselves to more of a, a servitude role of being like, I'm going to assist you. I'm going to carry your light stands just so I can be here and understand what makes this thing move forward. And I think a lot of times in that process and, and a huge portion of what we're doing here at ProEDU is to show people, you know, this is the closest you can get to assisting without assisting. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that we wish we could assist, and, but, you know, they're maybe going to take on one assistant every two or three years. And so that's not really fair to everybody. Who who's takes on to go, one assistant every two or three years? I mean, people grow out of the sure. assistant role and then they're ready to move on. And then you, you get another assistant. When I've, when I've taken what I can oh, get from you, then I move on to I've the next round. I've literally been assistant. sending yeah. messages yeah. to reversing. Like every three months. And so if, if you happen to be listening to this podcast, Paolo, I would love the opportunity to assist you. Never stop assisting. Yeah, same. I mean, you, you, it's really true. It, I mean, I think, no, I think totally. that's a lot I'm of the ways. Yeah, that's a lot of the ways that you you actually, again, understand the habits that successful people are putting into play. You want to learn how to be a millionaire? You better hang out with millionaires, period. If you want to learn how to be a successful photographer, you better start hanging out with other successful well, photographers. And I think as I, as I started to pivot into education, that was one of the things that I really loved. And I say it and it's cliche, but when I'm talking to students or mentees or whomever um, is there with me, whether it's in person or digitally, I'm like, I literally am learning from you. And, you know, someone comes into my studio and I'm like, hey, here's the lights and here's the setup and you do what you want. What are you going for? And they're like, hey, I want to put this here and I'm, I'm not going to interfere with that process. And all of a sudden I look at the output image and I go, wow, that's beautiful light. Like I, my mind doesn't work that way. So thank you for introducing me to this. And I think that's the really amazing thing about being an educator is that if you're receptive and you can put your ego by the wayside, it's, it's a very reciprocal learning process. That's, that's amazing. Do you, do you ever get worried about um, looking at other photographers work that maybe they're like, you know, big time or something like you might, maybe you shouldn't look at their work or it's, it's a thing that's common. I think it's, it's a weird artists. thing. I, I, I think like the comparison mindset, it's easy to spiral into that, you know, where I'm feeling good and all of a sudden I see someone I know and they have the cover of Vogue or Harper's and I go, uh, okay. You know, and I, I kind of get into this, this very introspective dysfunctional mindset where I'm like, well, my work's terrible. That's why I'm not on Harper's, you know, or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think there's a need for distance. And at the same time, I don't want to be dissonant. So that's going back to the fine lines that we walk. I think I, I want to be aware of what's being created and who's doing what, because it pushes me and drives me. But I don't want to use that as a barometer for my own work. And trying to find some semblance of balance in that interplay is, is challenging, but it also keeps me moving forward and is, is sort of the fire under my feet because I see someone doing something great and it's, Rather than being jealous, I'm like, I, I want to do that too. Therefore, 
I'm going to run faster now. But I think that's the greatest thing. And again, going back to that uh, assistant model, if you see somebody else doing something great, there's two ways you can look at that. You can be jealous and, and be the hater and be like, well, they got something they don't deserve. Or you can look at that as the possibility, the proof in the pudding that somebody else, if somebody else can achieve it, I can achieve it too. It isn't some magical talent that was bestowed upon them at birth that I didn't receive. It is nothing more than a step of processes that they practiced and they were intentional with until they mastered it. And, and, and let's be frank, if you don't, if you don't continue to push that forward, somebody else is going to sit there and analyze all of your stuff and figure out how you do your thing and, and that's why continued growth is an important process. You know, like if you just sat there on your laurels and was like, hey, I'm happy, I'm fat, I'm just going to collect all that's mine. Somebody's going to catch up and, yeah. and take your place because they want it more. And so I think like that's that's the great thing about this this whole thing is, you know, if somebody, if somebody else is hungry, either they overtake the headline or, you know, the headline's got to run just a little bit faster and, and keep, going and going and going and going and, and, and in doing so they're taking us all forward. They're, they're pushing the craft. They're evolving this entire process into its next evolution of, of whatever. And, well, and that's what I think is exciting. It's kind of piggyback piggyback off that for a second. I think what's really interesting to me, at least in, in my respective circle or sphere or, you know, whatever is, is that you get people who say, okay, I want to be on the cover of Vogue. And then you get people who are essentially shitting on photographers who made it to the cover of Vogue and going, their work's this, their work's that, they're not this, they're not that. And it's like, well, the editors obviously found value in what they did. So if you want to be in this publication, then maybe you should shift your work toward this. So just, you know, kind of an awareness of, of where you want to be and why you want to be there and not saying, hey, like this publication, this client should shift around me. But if that's really your goal, like genuinely rooted, saying I'm going to shift around, you're talking that. about that new masterclass tutorial, ain't ya? I might be saying things, yeah, yeah. Be, because because so, people okay. have talked. So let's talk about it yeah. because I think it. You make a good point. I wouldn't have bet money that uh, he shot for the cover of Vogue. Yeah, but I'm also in his camp of, hey, these Vogue editors know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. Uh, they might be seeing something that I'm not. It's it's not something I would expect, especially like looking through like an Instagram. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like it's so different and so new. It's like I might be way behind this like trend or curve to like really get it yet. Well, and I think I think that really for me, it comes down to this idea of of, of formulaic approach. Right. People go, OK, if I put someone in the top third of my frame and if I light them this way and if they're wearing this clothing, that it yeah. stands to say that what I'm doing is good. And in this, you know, this this gent, this photographer is literally like, this is what I see in my head. This is what I'm making. This is what I'm creating. And so there's an authenticity. And if you take a publication like Vogue, I think that, you know, they do a lot of things, but they value authenticity. And so it's not even necessarily like, oh, this is something we're going to hang in a magazine, but this is expression. And yeah. ultimately, if you yeah, look yeah. at fashion, fashion is expression. And a lot of times people are like, well, I don't get it. And it's like, that's the point. Like the point is that a lot of people aren't going to get it. This is not like consumer level stuff. Well, and I think the danger in photographers is that we're constantly looking at photography. Yeah. And in doing so, like Absolutely. we're basic. It's the same thing as getting in stuck in any pick your political cycle and you, you enter into this vacuum chamber of mm -hmm. ideas that are all the same. I think photographers, we often end up in that place where all I'm doing is observing other people who are doing things that are similar to me. And then I think that that's the way forward. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And all I keep doing is emulating the work. And then other people are emulating my work because they're looking at it. And, and I mean, especially if you're using social media as that, as that platform of choice, it feeds you what you like. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> as you, like, as you continue to like things, it's like, Oh, well, let me expose you to things that look like the other things that you like. And before long, there's no originality. There's I, no moving forward, except totally. for the people who are breaking that mold and saying, I'm, I'm intentionally going to be different because I'm tired of I, dissonance, I, I, like I creating say, dissonance. Like I, I get my best ideas from parallel disciplines. Yeah. Always. Same. Yeah. I well, mean, uh, this, again, th this was something that like Chris and Lindsay suggested to me and something that I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm bearing 
be trying to be very intentional in, but like, you know, Chris was saying he likes cinema and, and, and physical paintings. And Lindsay was saying that she liked music videos for inspiration. And I, I mean, for me, I've, I've started to look a lot at uh, graphic novels because, you know, a graphic novel artist's entire purpose is to tell a story in a single frame, which is arguably what story like yeah. photographers that's what we're supposed to do right and so i i've turned to that source to and even bought books on like how to draw graphic novels and stuff no intention of drawing graphic novels but i do want to tell a more intentional story in a single frame so trying to understand that process and and purposely trying to look away from photography to figure out why do i want to continue to do photography like what is the entire purpose what am i trying to say here and I think it's super important because otherwise, again, we're going to continue to repeat what we see because that visually stimulates us and, and lodges in our memory and understanding the way that our brain works helps us break that cycle a little bit more. No, I, I agree completely. And I, I draw a lot from cinema and I, I try and get out of the photographic spectrum. I love going to museums. There's the Kirkland Art Museum in Denver, which is literally just like mid-century furniture. And I walk into that that's place. Your jam. Yeah, it's just, but it's the lines, something on like a martini glass. See, that's I, what I like right there is like, I take inspiration from furniture in my photography. That's like, that's cool. Well, that's, I, that's like, how do you derive meaning from some other visual object yeah. that seems totally unrelated and you're actually killing it because you can understand how to synthesize well, that. And I think as, as David alluded to, there's an interesting psychological component to this, right? Because if you're a photographer and you're looking at photography, there's automatically me versus them. Yeah. There's this mindset. If I'm looking at a sculpture, if I'm looking at Rodin, I'm not thinking, oh, the sculpture versus my photography. All I'm seeing are, are lines and figures and emotion. And that comparative mindset is gone. Now it's nothing but just literal raw um, inspiration for me where I'm not deconstructing my own work. I'm reconstructing my own work into what it might be because of that influence. Um, and that's, that's the crazy. only way. I, I think that's the best way to find like big advancements that get you out ahead of the pack. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can try all sorts of crazy stuff if you have no, you know, like sort of visual foundation behind it. It's true. And people question, is that even a style? Well, like, is that even valid? It's funny because, you know, a lot of people talk in the, in, in the communities, uh, you know, for pro EDU or other places on uh, social media. And it's like, oh, I look back at my work and, uh, you know, they're just, they're hating on their own work. And I look back at my own work and there's sort of a melancholy because I wasn't constrained. You know, I, I look back at my original portrait and fashion work and it's like, is it technically a sound? Absolutely not. But... I wasn't thinking about all of these elements that ought to be in the frame and therefore I was free and I can see that freedom in that exploration. Yeah. And that's important. It's important to try and return to that and to liberate ourselves from the constraints that we place. Well, there's, ourselves. there's, there's absolutely something that happens in the process of growth at, I feel like at, at a certain degree. And, and I think that typically for us, this is around five, year five, six of being a photographer where you've started to obtain so much knowledge that the knowledge of the knowledge is <laughs> paralyzing you uh, and where you're sitting there, you're seeing things and you're like, well, it doesn't fit all of these rules. It doesn't fit. I, I didn't do X. I didn't do X. I didn't do X. So this sucks. And then I think beyond that, there, I mean, so, so originally there's just this, I'm, I'm fumbling, I'm playing, I'm exploring. The exact same way a child would learn to draw. Let's say I'm just scribbling and then suddenly I see something pleasing in the scribble and then I try to repeat it. And then I repeat it so much that it becomes habit. But then that habit becomes like a crutch until you mm. finally break away and you're like, I, I'm tired it's of like, drawing this like way. That, that uh, eight drawing you drew as like a kid on, on paper in middle school, you know, like how you everyone would draw like, it's like a... Like eight, an or is S. it nine? Or is it S? Yeah, yeah. the S. It's yep. like an eight. Yeah, you it looks almost everywhere. like it. Yep. And it would be in every notebook. Yep. Everything you did, you yeah. just did it over exactly. and over. Exactly. Like, oh, and, and until it got so... it's so symmetric. Yeah, until it got so perfect that you were like, I could do this in my sleep. And then sooner or later, you're like, ah, there's a lot of other letters. How can I draw the other letters? Let's figure that out. Can't. And I think I think that evolution of, of thought is what ultimately 
So you're free at first, then you become a, a, a slave to all the rules, and then yep. you say screw all the rules, and you break away, and you go into the next thing. Well, no. And that evolution is, I think, what creates this, you, makes you an outlier, because yep. ultimately, in my opinion, I don't think anybody at this table wants to be the very best in the world at what they do, because being the best in the world sucks. <laughs> Uh, honestly, like if you're the best photographer in the world, that sucks because all you're doing is you're repeating processes that already exist. Yeah. In my opinion, our, our job here How is that to, make sense? So, so stay with me for just, just a second. Repeating? You're that, repeat, doesn't that mean that everyone's just repeating the process? Absolutely. Except the for the person who go, becomes the innovator. So the people that we remember in history. So the innovator can't be the best. No, they are the person who takes all of the knowledge that the person in the best that is the best has as well. But then they say, "What can I do beyond this point? Like, so how the, can I change?" So then the they system? become the best. No, I like, mean, so I guess no. technically, but they've changed I, the whole game. I'm afraid so, the goal, the like, the end point of this conversation is maybe ego death. I don't know. I mean, to I, a degree, I, yeah, I was, kill I the just, ego and and go off and do. I had to bring up Gary making nachos with tortillas, and I felt like that was innovative. You know, everyone loves nachos, and Gary made them on tortillas instead. And we can pretty much connect. Well, anything chips are just tortillas Not that instead, are deep fried. There was a. Uh, there were also chips on top but they, they weren't were tortilla chips they were potato tacos, chips tacos but Not with leaving. nachos inside of them and then you like basically wrapped it and cut it out like lasagna so you cook you took uncooked tostitas and no, then you, you tortillas flour yeah. ones fuck the corn ones get that shit out of my kitchen damn Never. i love corn fuck corn tortillas i'm yeah. saying it on I, record i'm right triggered now. and wounded fuck and upset you know what i'm right in now. camp gary on that Fuck him. I mean, I'm if on, I got I'm an option, I'm, I'm going flour. I'm going flour. And David's going to the bathroom. He's out. David's leaving because oh. anyway, he's anyway, for corn. Anyway, so base. That's going to all absorb tacos. all yeah, Can you break stuff, down the layers for us in this concoction? All the stuff that drips down when you're baking it, it gets wet. You don't want it to get wet. You need something to absorb it. So then you put that shit down. Six uh, flour tortillas. And then immediately a little bit of cheese. And then... Chips mixed with sliced chicken that we made in the sous vide for like three hours. It was tender. And then finished on the trigger. Then that was sliced uh, thinly, mixed in with a little bit more. And then like a candied jalapeno mm. on top of that. I want some in. nachos. And then, and then I spoon fed in. Only if like, there's like it, corn like it was to, to a baby. Uh, refried uh, black beans on top of that. Oh my God. A little bit yeah. more cheese. This was like watching Yo-Yo Ma salsa. play and then, in person, and then watching him do out, this. It was when it came intense. Out of the oven, then you add in a little bit of sour cream, the things that probably shouldn't be baked, and uh, a little salsa. And ooh, it's it's great. Can we go get nachos now? Cause well, it's crazy awesome. that yeah, we had David. To go. You were asleep during this. <laughs> I was. Yeah. This gets because I go to bed at a reasonable hour. Yeah. Crux of what we're talking about, though, is like. We had to talk about photography and retouching and art super deep in order to get to this point where we realized what like the real core takeaway of this podcast was. Nachos. True. Nachos. True. Gary's nachos. Takes time. You gotta explore. They were yeah. good. I hit it so on them and then I explore yeah. and I tasted it and put I in like, unique ingredients. Push it beyond boundaries and you'll get a well, classic see plate of nachos. Lasagna is the parallel discipline. There it is. In this case. There it is. Yeah. Right, we're out. Same ingredients, just different cultures. And built a different way. Yeah. Man. Well, and on, on that note, I think uh, this was a great podcast, guys. It was, it was awesome to yeah. just be uh, yeah, with thank other you. people. Fantastic. What do you say we do two more? You. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, I won't be here, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to be doing while we're doing the next two podcasts? I drink Having it, you loose in my house? Drinking and or sleeping. Maybe both. Sleeping? Maybe just, do you sleep? I, I thought mean, you just waited. I picture you like <laughs> in your room like a bat. Like, like an alligator. He puts on, he puts on the, the next day's outfit. Waiting. I don't sleep. I just wait with my eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Honestly, I'm, prob I'm, I'm probably going to drink and wait. Yeah, yeah I'm going to yeah. drink and wait. I, I, no. I, I tried to wedge, for all of you listening to this, myself into another podcast. David's like, I don't know if I want to do three of these. I'm like, put me in. I'm good. Like, let me do this. Well, you can just sit on the couch over there, and if someone might tap you in, if you know. All right. Well, I'm, go I'm going to be there. We we might. Yeah. Just it might. Her. You might yeah. hear my voice. Yeah, and we're doing on video now too. So. Remember me if if you don't hear me again. Remember, remember yeah. me. Let's so if it. if you're listening to this podcast, this is also available on our YouTube, youtube.com 
slash pro edu tutorials. I'm the guy in the tie. He's the guy in the tie. You can, you can tell the head also, tattoo wouldn't be obvious. You can tell also too because the his mouth moving equals the words that you hear. And you should be That's, able this to is highbrow. He's talking technical now. You should be able to determine He's who's talking, talking technical now. Gotta get a first Gary early in the morning the to get one over <laughs> yes, Gary Martin. It's a thing. <laughs> Gary. Oh, Too much, right. man. All That's right. production right, talk. Else. Done. Pro EDU is now unlimited. Get access to every single tutorial. Sign up at proedu.com today. I don't know about you. I'll take comfort in that. This podcast is officially over. See you next time. Never stop.